if you didn't think I was winging it before, now it's going to become really evident. Um, I've been asked to mention a couple of things. Uh, the first is, what was the first? The first was, oh yes, if you have questions, we're going to try to keep our speakers to their 15 minute time and then allow you all uh, five minutes for discussion. But if you do have a question, please find a microphone or go up to the microphone here. And B would really like it if you would introduce yourselves and let us know where you come from so that we could um, try to keep this uh, intimate and help everyone um, meet each other and learn more about each other. So that was the first. And the second thing was the posters. Yes, so the posters. <coughs> looks like a couple of you are delinquent poster presenters because your posters are not up there. So if you can, please get them up because uh, people are reading them and circulating. Okay, so let's get on to our first speaker, Michael Gaffrey, who's going to talk about neurobiologic mechanisms of positive affect in preschool age children. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay. So first, thank you for, for asking me to be here and allowing me to, to give a talk a little bit on some of the work I've been doing. Um, I think some of the work so far is really preempting some of the slides that I have here, uh, particularly Dr. Diamond's talk this morning. Um, because I think it comes as no surprise to all of us that the experience of positive emotion is, is something that, by and large, is a good thing for us. Uh, and it's been associated with a number of different benefits, including the idea of, you know, uh, increased cognitive flexibility, so we can talk about executive functions, uh, increased ability to cope with negative affect, uh, but also the idea of perceived social support, um, and at the physiological level, in terms of self-regulation, positive emotion, the experience of it at least, does a lot for us. But I would suggest also that it's almost a dynamic interplay between positive and negative affect may, may be most important for us when we face the developmental challenges across sort of micro and macro time scales. Uh, meaning that if we think about the day-to-day -day challenges that we face, right, our lives are up, up and down in terms of positive and negative experiences and emotion, um, as well as across development. We face different challenges that may be more prolonged in nature. And I think if you look at a couple different examples here, uh, including the first one here, we have increased attention to information that elicits positive affect um, as well as positive memory and healthy aging, uh, it really does quite a bit for us to sort of undo the experience of negative affect and even actually potentially buffer uh, the experience of the potential experience of negative affect for us. Kind of going down the, the lifespan continu continuum, if you think about infants and caregivers, right, uh, a lot of this research now suggests that the process of repair between positive and negative emotion uh, within this dyad is critically important for a couple of different things. One being attachment, which is obviously a developmental uh, hurdle is very important at this time, but also for later social and emotional development of the child, and I'd even suggest for the development of the parent. Um, so sort of from this, this 10,000 foot view, uh, it's raised a question of interest for me, at least from the developmental perspective, um, that I think many of you share in this room, is how can we begin to understand the uh, the influence of the outcomes of our actions, whether they be good, positive, negative uh, emotions, uh, as a result of our behavior, to promote behavior that uh, maximizes the potential to appropriately respond in a given environment uh, to experience a positive emotion, or at least reduce the potential effects of negative emotion, but also um, but also uh, allow us to, to maximize goal attainment. Be aligned with what we're trying to seek and is able to kind of go move, move towards that. Um, one portal of entry, because that's obviously a complicated question, uh, not one study or series of studies can answer that, but one portal of entry that the adult literature and now a large body of school age and the adolescent child literature suggests uh, into this is the idea of reward processing. Because reward processing is the central component that's intimately involved in things such as uh, uh, throughout incentive based learning, appropriate responses to given stimuli, and the development of directed behavior. In terms of the developing brain, it also gives us a tractable model uh, that is somewhat specific, giving some level of specificity to brain function and organization in terms of what brain regions are important for this, both at the level of outcomes, so experiencing the result of your actions, but also anticipating what may actually result from your actions. Um, given that I'm, I'm interested in doing this in very young children, uh, one of the primary areas of interest for me has been the idea of outcome. Right? The intact experience of an outcome is going to be pretty critical for goal directed behavior in the future, but also the anticipation of what may happen as a result of what you're doing. We've seen some models of, of regions involved in uh, 
positive affect or war processing, including insular ventral striatum, uh, ventral prefrontal cortex, et cetera. And I just point to a recent meta-analysis here that suggests that these regions are also critically important for consumption. So looking at this division of the appetitive sort of uh, approach or anticipation and consumption of an outcome of a reward task. Um, what I think it does, it also gives us a sort of a tractable model to look at development within these regions. Clearly, a lot of work before this meta-analysis came out suggested that there are some things that are specific to developmental periods. So there are some work to suggest that in children, uh, the outcome, whether it be positive, negative, or non-reward, essentially a neutral outcome, may not differ in terms of its brain response. In, in fact, the ventral striatum in, in some of these studies actually responds similarly to either no outcome or gain. It also suggests that there may be dynamic patterns of change across developmental periods. So sometimes there may be the suggestion that the ventral striatum is more reactive in adolescents versus children and adults, or it's sort of inverted U-shape. Um, I think it raises some really incredible and interesting and important questions. Um, but I think, to this point, at least, the imaging literature and war processing is focused on a, a period of development which is critically important in adolescence, in early pre-adolescence now. But it's also not tapping into what may be a critical element uh, in terms of the development of some of these things that we're talking about here. And that is the very early preschool period. And you know, I think this, this study by Olino and colleagues points out something very interesting here at the level of behavioral expression in terms of positive or negative affect. That there may be divergent trajectories of each of those. What that means is really something that needs to be more investigated or more deeply investigated. But it may suggest that A, you know, the uh, ability to use positive emotion to regulate negative affect is, is more emerging. Um, it also may be that they have learned, or are beginning to learn, how to maximize their interactions with the environment based on their prior experience. So they're able to engage in activities that lead to more positive emotion, expression of emotion, positive emotion. So I think if we can move down a little bit further, um, it's going to behoove us quite a bit because there's a lot of research now suggesting that not only is this developmentally important in terms of future social emotional functioning in the environment, but also there are disruptions that are occurring as early as age three that are frank psychopathology in terms of depression, uh, but also more trait level characteristics in, ter in terms of impulsivity. So we can all think of, of kids who may be a little bit impulsive in terms of how they seek and go after things that they really want. Right? Some learn to stop, maybe take a different approach, others continue to continue to persist even in the face of, of blank, uh, frank uh, no's, if you will. So the goal of the study I'm talking about today uh, was to develop a test that we could use in four, five, and six year olds, just kind of preschool age range, right? Um, you know, that's the, the period I found to be able to go lowest in terms of imaging kids that are awake. Um, and the idea was to develop a test that was usable within the context of fMRI, um, but also allowed us to maybe potentially explore some relationships between what we saw in the scanner and the parent reported behavior of these children. So developing this age appropriate reward processing test uh, took a little bit of thought, right? And I needed to find a test that linked itself to this purpose. But I also wanted to make sure that it fit within the broader scope of what we already were doing. So it could tap into what we already know. Um, so response requirements can be transported to these with the same guiding principles. Uh, the outcomes for a four, five, and six year old using money uh, isn't necessarily the, the most salient thing for them, but can be this. And I'll show you that in a second. <laughs> Uh, and then the considerations for imaging a very young group needed to be respected. Obviously, the, the idea of movement in imaging research, that's my particular, is, is a pillar. Um, so you kind of had to think about how to limit the response requirements for the given task. Cognitive load, uh, I think we heard quite eloquently already that you know, cognitive load can have quite an effect on, on performance. Um, so I want to keep it as, as simple as possible to so limit things like relations of learning uh, and different required task responses uh, based on specific uh, parameters and guidelines or something like this. Uh, a willingness to play, right? Obviously these kids, you know, um, adults, adolescents, you need to tell them to go on the scanner and ask them to do what we want them to do, and, and generally they'll follow along. Uh, kids this young need to sort of be enthused about what it is you're asking them to do. Uh, so they need to find this to be fun, and with the idea that there's a potential payout for that, uh, that they really wanted to consume. Um, and the time of each run and the time spent in the scanner. You know, when you're scanning kids this young, you have a very limited amount of time that you have to work with. So within this, uh, within the scope of this sort of framework, uh, you know, looking to the literature, we have obviously the early work by Delgado with this car guessing game task. And essentially in this case, what you have is a question mark comes up, 
you're going to determine whether or not the next value you see is larger or smaller than five. Potential outcomes is if you win based on your guess, you guess appropriate and you gain something, in this case money. If you don't guess appropriate, you lose something, so you lose money, uh, or neutral outcomes, so no gain or loss. Um, as well as some recent work by Kevin Newton and Deanna Barch looking at candy as an outcome, both in adults and in children, suggesting that the outcome of candy equally elicits activity in the regions that we just mentioned in terms of insulin, commercial striatum, et cetera. Uh, so sort of a forward processing network. So in order to try to, to stay in line with those tasks uh, that were previously used and to good effect, I developed one that had the same kind of decision process here for young kids. They had to make a determination in the sense of 50-50 probability. They had to determine whether or not the next person they saw was going to be bigger or smaller than them. The next person they saw was either an adult or an infant. Uh, it could also be a similar age child, it's in the center there, which will result in no one. So they gained either candy or they lost candy. Um, and just, just to point out some record that they're really related designs. So when the question mark comes up, the outcome immediately follows two seconds later. Okay? And then there's a jittery interval of two to six seconds. The kids practiced this before they got the scanner, so they were familiar with the task. They chose the candy that they were going to win before going into the scanner, so in this case, MM just goes. Uh, they the idea of bigger or smaller was counterbalanced, so I only required only one response to be made. Either it shows the bigger response, you press the button, it makes me bigger, so a non response was also a response. So let's say the idea is bigger, you press the button, you think it's bigger. If you don't think it's going to be bigger, you do not press the button. Okay, so eliminating movement in that way. And then all the outcomes are pseudo randomized across the trials. <coughs> Did this to 31 kids that uh, up to relatively recently, between 4 to 6 years of age, the average age is 72 months. Roughly split between males and females, also pretty much half six year olds, half five four year olds. Uh, 21 of them had no history of psychiatric difficulties, 10 had a current history of depression, uh, and neurological disorders, presence of autism spectrum disorders, trauma, delay, et cetera, after this exclusionary criteria for, both, for all of them. Just briefly, the schedule of affective disorders for early childhood, so something that we edited and modified from case SGL for young children three to six, was used for psychiatric status. And then the BIS fast scales uh, developed by Clancy Blair for preschool age children are also in use. Focusing on the fast scale, the three separate scales there are drive, fun seeking, and reward responsiveness. Each child completed two runs of 161 TRs, basically you know, processing steps and follow. I also want to point out that we censored time points of greater than 0.9 uh, millimeters displacement, absolute, meaning that if it took more than 9, 0.9 millimeters absolute to realign the frame to the previous one, that one was excised or censored from the GI. Given that we did use an assumed response shape here, so basically what the data to dictate what the hemodynamic response would look like uh, using repeated measures in NOVA to look at the different data types in terms of main effective time, which is of interest, right? So we saw a shape that resembled the hemodynamic response function as expected, but also conditioned by time. <clears throat> So conservative approach to analyses with some regions of interest that we thought were particularly important for this, including starting with the amygdala, which we thought would be important for the salience of the idea of the outcome, right? Particularly sensitivity to uh, gain and loss, but not necessarily neutral. A mass by Captain McKinney in the 2013 paper that included some of the core lower processing network regions, and then given that development likely involves things outside of these regions that we know from adults and adolescents in these young kids, a whole brain uh, focus. On average, each kid completed 61% of the trials with a button press, suggesting that they were making differential, differential responses to the, to the queue. So not necessarily just compulsively pressing the button each time or not pressing the button at all. Average response time was about a second. Uh, similar across runs. Six children only provided one run. Uh, you can see that on average after post-scrub, there's a very low level of movement left in data. But also the average number of things removed for scrubbing was very low in each, each of the kids. Starting with our left amygdala, we saw an outcome by time interaction with a greater response to gain and loss following, uh, following the outcome at the second PR there, so time two. Uh, neutral showed a little bit of a wiggly pattern there, uh, but um, essentially was different from time points five to seven with, uh, with gain and loss. So then the pre genual anterior cingulate in the region spanning sort of the uh, Roman area 32 to 10, we saw a time by condition effect as well, favoring gain over loss. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the details of the whole brain map for this time by condition, but to suggest that, importantly, there are other, are other regions that were sensitive outside of our reward processing regions in general uh, in these young kids that might be of interest as we think about how these networks change across the world. And obviously, there's a large effect of time. So there were a number of regions that didn't show a differential response 
two outcomes, including things like the insula uh, and the mental striatum. <coughs> but this shows some interesting patterns in terms of the time course. The, with the visual system there responding to the early presentation of the outcome, as well as some regions moving towards the vegetal kind of orbital frontal areas from more of a delayed response, uh, potentially suggesting the idea of integration of outcome across time. Gain lines loss difference in the pregenital pre anterior cingulate was related to parent reported drive behavior based on the BAS. So, what you see here is a, a plot of the line, the difference uh, across the different TRs, percent mean signal change. And what I did is I took the time points from 4 to 7 for the gain and loss, summed them together and subtracted gain or loss from gain to get the different score and the correlation here. Suggesting that greater <coughs> difference uh, was highly associated with the idea of greater drive related behavior by the, as reported by the parents for each child. So, in summary, I guess I would say that the early childhood gambling test elicits activity in regions expected for reward. Uh, some of those regions not showing a profile of difference between outcomes, uh, but that's in line with some of the previous literature out there. There are some important patterns of differential uh, activity within some of the regions uh, that we suggest would be important and it may be in ways that we'd anticipate based on the literature. So, the amygdala is responding to gain and loss is something salient. Uh, but also, the pregenital cingulate has been definitely shown to uh, some, show a preferential response to gain versus no gain and loss. Um, and that the difference between gain and loss in the anterior signal may be importantly related to, to actually sort of reward-seeking behavior. Although, given the small end and, and sort of preliminary findings, I'm not going to make a lot out of that. So future directions, uh, some of these are obviously clear, you know, longitudinal, risk, stress, et cetera, some of the things we've talked about before. So at this point, I'd just like to thank everybody who's been involved in the study, including Joan Lugie and Deanna Barch, uh, who have been instrumental in helping get this work off the ground, and of course the funding agencies here, uh, thank you and IMH for my K award to do this uh, in particular. Um, and with that, I guess I'm going to be done.